All right. Well, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Um, Who's relieved that the hardcore bioinformatics is over? <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to talk about sample collection biases, integrating sample handling as well um, into all of this this afternoon. In a lot of ways, it's still intense. There's still a lot to think about um, and not a lot of hard answers a lot of the time, but I'll share with you what I've learned from a decade of making a lot of mistakes in this area. <laughs> um, all right. And hard to advance the slides up here. Okay, so these are the learning goals, again, from today's lecture. Um, so like I said, we're gonna talk first about sample collection, but it's really two main parts, and then there's some subsections within sample handling we'll talk about. Um, but really, when you're thinking about sample collection and sample handling in microbiome, you really do need to be thinking about what it is that you're going to try to detect. What is your question and what kinds of biomolecules are you interested in? You know, it's kind of like looking at the microbiome with all these different sets of glasses, right? Like what you, um, you know, are going to see depends on whether you're set up well to see it. And so you need to think about that ahead of time. I think where a lot of people have gotten into trouble in the field is taking from the literature, which focuses heavily on DNA stability and processing, and collecting their samples based on best practices for that. And then nowadays they're like, oh, I wanna do other stuff. I wanna measure carbohydrates and metabolites and proteins. Well, were you set up from the beginning of your study to, to measure those things or not? So really my lab's work is heavily focused. And I would say in general, the work we're doing in the International Microbiome Center is heavily focused on multiomics. So we are all about preparing our samples, preserving our samples to be able to do everything. Look at every type of biomolecule at some point. And also we're adding culture um, capacity into a lot of our studies so that you know, we get all this material, it's super valuable and we can use it for all kinds of analyses in the future. And that takes a lot of work and a lot of planning and a lot of time. <laughs> So if that's not your cup of tea, you know, a lot of the data and um, tips I'll give you are also just set up for DNA because that's where we've really done most of our standardization. Um, and a lot of people are only interested in making sure their DNA is okay and that's good enough and that's fine. But I'm gonna kind of paint the picture from both sides today because we are definitely interested in multiomics. So this is just gonna give you the overview then of how you set this up in your thinking. So if you're just interested in who's there, then you're going to go for your amplicon sequencing, your shotgun sequencing, look at your taxa, right? And you just need DNA for that. But if you're interested in what they can do, you're going to have to go with shotgun sequencing, right? These are all things that you guys have become very familiar with this week. And then from John's lecture this morning, if you want to know what they are doing, what are they doing right now? That's where you're going to get into your metatranscriptomics. And potentially, and in, I think growing capacity in the field, proteomics and metabolomics. Um, and you can see that when you get into this last bit here, there's all kinds of biomolecules that you may be interested in, that you may want to capture. Um, and so it doesn't, it becomes not so straightforward how you prepare and design and collect your samples and process them to enable you to look at all of these diverse types of biomolecules in the future. But what we've kind of come to as the sort of simple solution to all this in the microbiome field is this. Freeze as soon as possible, store at minus 80, minimize freeze thaws. Simple, right? How hard could it be? But it turns out that there actually are a lot of things that kind of come up with this. So this slide shows you then, you know, the schematic of sample collection. And in my role leading the IMC core facilities I talked about yesterday, certainly we have seen all kinds of samples. Um, I have processed most of these types of samples except for plants and soil, but I put them on here because I know there's a number of environmental folks, but you know, you might be working with, you know, whole um, animals, insects, worms, tissue samples, of course, we've got our fecal samples, different types of liquids could be sampling water or urine, breast milk, 
um, different kinds of swabs that are going to capture the surface material and the mucosal uh, fluid um, from different body sites, saliva. Anybody know what this one here down at the bottom is? Is there point here? Anybody know what that is? Yeah, menstrual cup. Turns out to be a great way to get cervical vaginal fluid. So that's a common sample type now as well. So you have all these different types of samples that you might be collecting and you, know, you have different devices and then you have different ways that you need to, you know, extract your biomass, get your microbial biomolecules out. Before you get there, though, you have all these steps. So sample handling really has four components, transport, storage, processing, and then your biobanking or your archival. In all of these you know, are places where you can introduce bias and you can't go back. We'll talk more about that. And then you need to extract these biomolecules that you're interested in. Okay. So like I said, um, sometimes there are mitigating factors or things that come up. You're like, okay, my plan is to freeze as soon as possible. That's the best practice. I want to store at minus 80 and minimize my freeze thaws. You get into the weeds here though. Well, what if my sample's at room temperature for one hour? What if it takes eight hours for courier transport? What if the samples are held at minus 20 in a participant's freezer for one week before it gets to my minus 80? There are so many what ifs when it comes to this idea of freezing at minus 80 as soon as possible. But when you get to the sample handling part, when you want to minimize your freeze thaws, okay, so I'm going to thaw my sample, I'm going to make my aliquot so I don't have to do too many more freeze thaws. But what if that process takes four hours and everything's on ice? Is that stable enough? What if I need to do a 30 minute spin for my process and I don't have a refrigerated centrifuge that will work? What if I didn't add protease inhibitors and I decide later I wanna do proteomics? All of these things sort of compound the lots of what ifs. And where we're at right now, microbiome science, is that it's just such a broad field. There's so many sample types, there's so many variances in, in accessibility and being able to adhere to these best practices. What you really have to do is plan, incorporate good controls and systems of evaluating, monitoring for batch effects, monitoring for problems, um, and try to stick to your plan, but like with the, with the monitoring, you know, adjust as needed. That's really what it boils down to. There's no simple, this will always work uh, when you get into the weeds here, especially with these smaller details. But I will share as we go on, you know, some of the, the things that we've learned along the way and some of the things that the literature is showing um, to be efficacious when it comes to these processes. Okay, so with Sample collection, then we have some technical considerations. Now, the goals here are to maximize our microbial biomass. In microbiome science, that's not always easy. Not just the biomass of what you're collecting, but that microbial component. Like, that's what we want to measure, especially if you want to look at the taxa and the genes or proteins that are encoding. You need that microbial biomass more than you need that host biomass, but sometimes you can't separate them, right? So you want to maximize that at the same time, avoiding contamination, perturbation, or dilution. Early on in the field, when I was working in this field, I kept finding that a lot of clinical folks, they insisted on every time they, they wanted to take swab samples and they're like, I'm going to put it in Amy's transport media. Why are you putting it in Amy's transport media? It was kind of like a you know, blinders were on from some historical processes of collecting swabs for um, anaerobic clinical microbiology, and we weren't necessarily always trying to culture these bugs. So I was like, why are you putting it into transport media? You know, a dry swab, don't dilute it, don't change anything, just keep the swab dry, freeze it, and then we go on to microbiome. So you do sort of find sometimes these um, ideas out there that don't fit, they're not compatible. They worked really well with the way that science was done in one way, but now that we're doing microbiome, we have to change our sample collection strategy. Don't put the swab in Amy's transport media you know, unless you need to culture or you need some very specific purpose for it. So otherwise you just don't want to add anything in or perturb um, in ways that aren't specifically for microbiome. So I know this is gonna be a little slanted to humans because that's where I work. And I know many of you work in that area as well, but of course we are considering when we design our studies for sample collection, 
There are many ethical considerations that are beyond the scope of my talk, but even from a technical standpoint, we still have to think about, we want to get the best sample quality and the best biomass we can, but we have to also couple that with participant safety, comfort, and compliance. And so, for instance, one of the things that's been explored and is still discussed um, quite actively in the field is whether we should be making people scoop this poop all the time. Like, who likes doing that? And honestly, in certain populations, it's really difficult. So, like, I'm running a study with autistic kids, right? And they have a lot of sensory processing differences that make it extremely uncomfortable for some of them to go through this process of having to change the way they poop and maybe having it right front and center for them after they're done. And of course the parents have to be heavily involved, but you know, it's a lot, it's a lot for certain people in certain populations to do this. So couldn't we just get them to wipe like normal and then just give that to us? And, and actually this was commonly used um, in one of the early studies called the American Gut Project. But then there was this like, oh, well, that's not a good process because they left it at room temperature and it's not enough biomass and all this. So these couple studies have come out a little bit more recently and gone back, reevaluated it and have shown it works quite well. Still, though, it's hard to kind of convince clinicians sometimes that they should just <laughs> let people send in some toilet paper instead of like a, a nice big pumpkin, you know, sample. So you know, it's one of those things that we have to think about. This would be a lot easier if we implement this more um, uh, commonly. Something else that's come up with my work, since we do a lot of swab samples, um, mostly vaginal swab samples, but we've also processed and done studies with respiratory swabs and oral swabs. And a, a simple way to get more biomass is simply to use a double tip swab. So participant doesn't have to do anything extra. They just have the swab has two tips instead of one. Um, we've also, you know, there's all different kinds of swabs and it does matter and you kind of have to test for yourself. We found that foam swabs work the best for us, um, but we use these double tip foam swabs. They work great. And the nice thing, we get twice as much biomass and we can split it off. As soon as we thaw it the first time, we can split one off. Like some of our studies, we do really want to treat with protease inhibitors. So we can treat, we have our protease inhibitor treated swab. And then our other swab, we keep pristine for our DNA and other work that we don't want to add anything to it. So it's a, you know, there are some simple hacks um, to keep the burden on the participant down. Don't make them collect a bunch of different swabs, but you still get more material to work with. Of course, there's size and weight constraints. Yeah, you want a lot of biomass, but I can tell you, when you got a whole butter dish of poop, it's almost like a little too much sometimes, and they take up a lot of space. So <laughs> McCoy people know what I'm talking about. So, um, <laughs> you know, you have to think about these things as well in your design. Also, you have to ship often these things, and weight can really affect these things, the cost. The material that the sample's going into, you have to plan around that, especially if you're planning to culture or you're working with low microbial biomass material. So, you know, there you can get microbial DNA free materials, tubes and so on. They're very expensive. They have to be treated with a gas, basically ethylene something, dioxide or something. You know, if you have an extremely low biomass sample where contaminant DNA, even a low amount is a concern, it might be worth it, but you have to think about these things ahead of time. Cold chain or preservatives. So again, ideally you maintain cold chain. That's sort of the standard in the field. We'll talk a little bit more about this on the next couple slides. Um, oxygen exposure. So this comes up a lot if you do want to culture mostly. And we've had a lot of success with just these simple little anaerobic bags. You can get these little bags that have like a nice thick, it's not just your regular Ziploc, it's got like a special um, kind of extra thick Ziploc closure, and you get these small little sachets that um, eat up the oxygen inside this bag. And this has worked really well for us. We're culturing 80% of the anaerobes in our vaginal samples just by having the clinicians pop it into this bag before they send it over to us. So there are some simple solutions that can really improve um, what you can get out of these samples. And of course, cost though. Every little thing, even these little anaerobic bags adds to the cost a lot. Okay, so like I said, if you don't make smart choices with sample collection, there's no going back, right? You got your samples, you got what you got. 
Um, and these are some things, this is a really nice review that kind of goes through um, really from the standpoint of DNA-based microbiome science, but some of the difficulties with different sample processing steps and how that can lead to um, sources of error and bias. Yeah, so with sample collection, you know, in addition to things I just said, you know, like, I mean, it kind of, I guess, echoes them. Inadequate sampling is really about the biomass, um, not getting the sample stabilized, not having the right biomolecules stabilized, um, having contamination. You really want to try to avoid having any contamination in your kits that you start with, your sampling kits. And labeling is also not always trivial because sometimes these things are like, like your swab is in a package, right? It's like in a sterile package sometimes. So your participant wants to open up that sterile package and kind of know that they have a sterile swab, but there's no label then on that swab. So they put the swab into a baggie. Maybe you've put a label on the baggie. That comes to your lab. You got to make sure that that label gets moved back to the swab before it goes in the freezer, right? So you have to really think about all of these little steps to make sure that you don't lose continuity of what's what and what's going on. Okay. So we're going to go into storage um, a little bit more now, like with handling. So like I said, this has three main parts. And here we want to stabilize our microbes and biomolecules, and then eventually partition aliquot and archive the biomass. Um, so this is highly sample type specific. Um, and the thing is, though, that what I've also learned you know, we, we tend to think fecal samples are not low biomass, but you get some really young babies and all of a sudden they're kind of low biomass. So these things do matter. It's not just the sample type, it's the age of the participant. Sometimes it's the sex. I didn't know when I started working with urine, I did not know that the biomass in female urine is like five to 10 times higher than the biomass in male urine. Oops. <laughs> so you have very different requirements for volumes that you collect depending on whether you're working with male or female urine. So, you know, things I've learned along the way, and sometimes, of course, with, you know, participants that might be very vulnerable going through severe illness, there's also, you know, there can be dramatic differences in the samples you get from those participants. All right, we've already kind of hammered through the idea that cold chain continuity is ideal, and this really goes all the way through these four steps, though, and maintaining that all the way through these four steps is not always trivial. Um, so we talked about maximizing biomass in your sample that you've collected, but sometimes you just also have to recover that and, and get it into the processing steps. So this is not always simple when it comes to swabs. Getting the material off of a swab is not super straightforward. And we've kind of actually worked on um, a little hack in my lab. I wanted to get a picture in here and I didn't get it in time, but... Um, there's these things called spin baskets, and there's a variety of different ones. And we finally found one from one manufacturer <laughs> works really well. And we actually clip our swab and we put it into the spin basket and we centrifuge the material off. And we've really increased our biomass recovery with the use of spin baskets. So you know, little details in your prep process can make a really big difference. As you're processing your samples, sometimes it's important to actually quantify your biomass because certain downstream analyses need to be normalized to weight. So a prime example of this is metabolomics. It really only works quantitatively if you can normalize to weight. So if you want to avoid your freeze thaws, one idea that you, know, you can think about that we've adopted is when we do that first freeze thaw and we go into sample handling the first time, we actually create many, many aliquots and some of them are weighed, especially for feces. It's not as easy to weigh other things like eluted material from a swab. For those, we track volume and we also take an aliquot off so that we can count cells. So we have a cell count and a volume. We can kind of infer some biomass numbers from that. With feces, we weigh. So most of my studies, I create at that first thaw, five to 10 aliquots some of them are different weights or different amounts, and they're sort of ready to go into different downstream analyses. Um, if you hadn't quantified anything at the first freeze thaw, then you're waiting till your second freeze thaw to get that weighed sample you need from metabolomics. So choices that you can make in your, in your own SOPs. Okay, adding stabilizers. I mentioned this, the kind of proteomics we're doing, we need to have protease inhibitors in there. Um, again, we don't want to add it to all of our samples because we don't want to 
necessarily you know, inactivate enzymes that we might, like sometimes we wanna measure protease activity and sometimes we wanna measure proteins that haven't been acted on in the lab. So we partition our sample and make sure we add it at that first three, freeze thaw right away. So we don't wanna go through multiple freeze thaws before adding something that's gonna protect a biomolecule. So that gives opportunity for things to change. And I can tell you an anecdote at the end if you want. We have seen that this actually happens. These enzymes are very active and things will change even on ice. Um, okay, like I said, we make many aliquots that are ready for downstream analysis. This takes a lot of time though. Um, but often it's worth the time and effort. It does sometimes save time in the secondary steps, like you can just pull your samples from metabolomics if they're all weighed out. We often off also put an aliquot into a bead beading tube, not with the lysis buffer, because that can cause problems, but just in the bead beading tube, it's already there in the tube, ready to go. We can pull our tubes, because we do a lot of robotic extraction, so 96 at a time, we can pull our tubes, add the lysis buffer, and we're ready to go. So we do a lot of that kind of pre-planning in these sample handling procedures. Um, and like I said, you do have to be mindful of biosafety for most human and animal work um, and also DNA clean procedures. So for, what this means for us, since we're working with a lot of different sample types and a lot of them are lower biomass, we have a separate room and it's a closed door room. We call it pre-PCR. And we just make sure that we don't bring lots of bug cultures in there. We don't bring amplified DNA in there. Um, and we also wear gowns. We do a lot of extra decontamination in this space with bleach because bleach will get rid of DNA, ethanol won't. And we have a UV spectral linker in there and we UV a lot of materials, not everything because some things will break down, but whatever we can UV or treat with bleach we do. So that helps keep the DNA burden down in the space. And we have a, bio, a true biosafety cabinet to protect the humans from whatever diseases might be in the samples mainly. And then we have some other smaller hoods that are just PCR laminar flow hoods to try to keep cells and dust and DNA, right? Which is dust is mostly microbial DNA and human DNA. Uh, we try to keep all that dust out of like where we're working on your samples. So those are, you know, pretty, you know, thought out and planned setups for a high throughput kind of microbiome processing lab. Um, but, you know, a lot of labs can adopt things like that, having the sample processing in, in a particular hood or, um, you know, making sure things are wiped down with bleach before you start. You know, there's lots of things that you can adapt um, even in a standard lab. Okay, any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt me. And we'll have time at the end for some chatter too, because this is not as long of a lecture. Um, so preservatives, I wish I had a really great answer for this. I'm working on a review and we're working on a big study in the um, as part of IMPACT with the McCoy Lab. I know lots of you here have been putting lots of effort into that. We're trying to understand more about sample handling procedures and preservatives, and it's tricky. Um, so far, it's mostly been evaluated for DNA. Um, there's lots of commercial options. They're very widely used. Um, OmniGene is probably one of the most commonly used, but RNA later and Zymo have been used quite a bit as well. OmniGene now has options for RNA metabolites, and of course, RNA later is good for DNA and RNA. People have used it for a long time. Um, but yeah, there's less literature in microbiome science about the effect of preservatives for RNA metabolites than there is DNA. And even with the DNA literature, it's really hard to compare and do a meta-analysis. On my next slide, I'll show you there's one meta-analysis that just came out that I'm working on understanding. But yeah, it's just hard because so many studies do so many different things. But most say that there are some minor differences when you add um, preservatives. You know, this is not as easily seen with diversity metrics. So that's all you care about. But if you really want to look at enrichment of taxa, there can be some differences. And like I said, I think it's still to be seen whether we really are seeing any consistent differences with so many different procedures, sample types, different preservatives. It's, it's just still hard to kind of iron out. But, you know, a lot of labs kind of go with one of these preservative methods for big studies, and then they want continuity with their other studies. So certainly if you want like continuity and cohesiveness, like sticking with preserved samples is good. But then for like cross-study comparisons, um, 
if you're interested, you know, in comparing to existing data that's out there where they didn't use preservatives and you did, you might have some bias there. Like there can be some potential for that for sure. And then interestingly, you know, I do think there's evidence in the literature. This is just one study, but we're, the one we're working on is kind of showing the same thing. And there's other studies. And I think the meta-analysis on the next slide also keyed in on this. If you're doing just DNA work, there's quite a bit of evidence that room temperature for a week is pretty much fine. So that actually can simplify and reduce costs a lot for microbiome studies. But yeah, I think people have been a little bit shy about it, thinking that it's better to go with preservative. And you know, I'm not sure that the evidence suggests that preservative is better than room temperature if you're only doing DNA. But the thing is, the preservative is not going to let you do um, like enzyme studies or like, yeah, enzyme activity assays or proteomics. You can't do that right now with preservatives anyway. So you're already kind of limited either way. All right. Interestingly, too, what we're seeing in our study, we're, we're going to present a little bit of our study at IMPACT next week, and it's not yet published, so I didn't want to put any data in, but we're seeing an effect of homogenization. And there is some evidence of this in the literature as well. And I think it's a little, I'm still working on understanding it myself, why? <laughs> and, and I think it matters a little bit when you homogenize. One study, this one by um, Zostak, said that the length of your homogenization matters. So yeah, it's a little hard to iron out still, but you know, there are, it's a factor. Maybe, maybe it's a more important factor than some of these other things, preservative or not. It could be that, you know, when you put things in preservative, you're kind of homogenizing at that time, right? You're kind of diluting it and mixing it up with the preservative. So I think it remains to be seen. Really, what's important? Is it homogenization? Is it the preservative? And, and yeah, what is the best practice with that? So this is this meta-analysis that just came out um, earlier this year. And um, you know, it's one of the first, I think, that's really tried to aggregate all of this literature. Um, so take a look at it, but yeah, it's, there's a lot to go through. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about extraction. So historically, this was thought to be one of the, the biggest influencers of interstudy variation. Um, and you can imagine that part of this was just, you know, are you really going to lice all of the bugs in your sample? Um, is your extraction kit contaminated with microbial DNA? And, and that's still actually not necessarily trivial to avoid. Um, and yeah, do you have cross-contamination? So if you're doing high throughput extraction, there's always potential, especially for cross-contamination in this process. So what we've learned over the years is that bead beating is critical. Um, the thing is, though, with this, that its effectiveness is sort of intertwined with the lysis buffer and how you agitate. So sometimes it's a little difficult to tease out, but certainly in some studies, um, you know, where they've had like a kit that's designed to work with bead beating. I think I have the reference here coming up, but they have a kit that's designed to work with bead beading and then a kit where they just added a bead beading step. Sometimes it doesn't work as well with the just add on. And we've also ha had the problem, I don't know if any of you have had the problem where you try to add bead beading in on a kit that's not designed for it, you end up with just a foam mess. <laughs> so not all lysis buffers can handle that degree of agitation without creating a huge foam mess. So you have to think about um, not just the bead beading, but kind of that whole package for extraction. And the bead type and size matters. And I think, you know, there's not a lot of, we're working on a study that's going to evaluate that. And there's not a great literature on it. But certainly if you're interested in fungi and bacteria, this is where it becomes really important because you need bigger beads to lyse fungi than bacteria. So that's why a lot of um, kits now put a combination of sizes together. And so like what's kind of become the go-to is this Kyogen Power Soil or Power Fecal Pro. These are essentially identical. They're often a go-to solution. And the study that I said where they um, had the difference, I think it was the ball study, the difference between this Power Soil Pro and just some other kyogen kit that they added bead beading in. Power Soil Pro was way better in that study. So these are just a couple of studies that have shown that Power Soil Pro or Power Fecal Pro is better. And I mean that lots of people homebrew their own phenochloroform and they love it and they've shown it's good in their hands. Um, we've tried off-label kits for specific 
you know, or just like smaller companies, I should say, for um, certain sample types. And we have had hits and misses, sometimes a lot of DNA contamination in the kit. Sometimes it's okay, but almost universally with a variety of sample types, we don't see better yields or sort of better performance from anything else when we compare to Power Soil Pro or Power Fecal Pro. So, you know, there's other options. You don't have to use this, but it's kind of become a pretty standard go-to. And a lot of my colleagues at the IMC feel the same way. And the reason it works well, it has to do with these mixed bead sizes lysis buffer, my postdoc lab always measured inhibition in their DNA. And we found back then, before it was acquired by Kaijin, it was this company mobile. By, by far, it was the best at having low inhibition. And all of our library prep methods, whether you're doing shotgun or amplicon, require PCR. So if you have PCR inhibitors, it's going to reduce the efficiency of the process. And it can be hard to avoid having inhibitors in microbiome samples, but this particular kit does a good job of reducing them. Um, I don't have any references for this. I haven't found a study. I need to go back and look more, but I've been in multiple labs that have tried to do plate-based bead beading, bead beading, and it's just always been associated with high cross-contamination. So we avoid it. We've tried it even again recently with whole genomes, and it was still too much cross-contamination. So unfortunately, I, I think, Best practices is to bead beat in tubes and at least in our hands. <laughs> so what if you can't bead beat? So for long read sequencing where you need these long DNA templates, you really can't bead beat. And so I think it really remains to be determined what's great for microbiome. This paper came out last year from um, the, Ar the Aaron lab. Um, and they're still working on it. They mainly were evaluating for microbiome samples. Um, the length of the reads and the amount of DNA, not perfectly evaluating yet whether you're getting all the taxolized and so on. So a well, ways to go with that maybe, um, but it's coming along. Okay, so those are the main sources of bias, really your sample handling and your extraction. When it comes to your sequencing library, though, there is some evidence in literature, and again, we're kind of seeing this in our own hands, that library prep, particularly for shotgun, um, can lead to some bias, so depending on which kit you're using. And there's a long-standing notion that there's GC bias in your library prep, and this can vary from kit to kit based on how the library is made, how the DNA is sheared, and how it's amplified from there. So... I don't know for sure yet if it's GC bias or if it's other aspects of library prep that are contributing to some of this microbiome variability, um, but this is starting to emerge and something to keep an eye out for. Okay, so this is just a different way to show what I just showed you, all the steps, right? All the steps, collection, storage, extraction, and then here all these lighter kind of orange um, circles then show all this bioinformatics that you've been thinking about for three days. So in this long sequence of events that go into microbiome multiomics, where do you think you need to think about positive and negative controls? Which steps? Extraction. Starting at extraction? Yeah. Extraction. extraction. Anybody else have any other ideas? Go ahead. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah. So it turns out, yeah, pretty much all of these steps, you should be thinking about controls. But, you know, kind of in line with what you're saying, um, sometimes these controls are started at the beginning and carried forward, and sometimes they're introduced at certain steps. And you really kind of have to do both to adequately control for all the steps. Um, these should be positive and negative controls, and they should be done routinely. <laughs> They're not, they are not always. Um, so for positive controls, what we're talking about are known or expected biological content or DNA or whole cell community standards. And we'll talk more about that in the next few slides. For negative controls, we're talking about collection materials that are sham or lacking biological material. So for instance, you know, like some of the ways that this has been done is for swabs, let's say. So if I have um, 
vaginal swabs that are being collected in the hospital. I definitely want the exact same kind of swab, and I want to carry it all the way through all of my storage procedures and biomolecular extraction. Some studies have gone so far as to like give the sham swab to a clinician, have them unscrew the tip, open it up to the air in the hospital environment where the regular samples are being collected, and then close it. So you don't introduce it to a patient, but you introduce it to all of the other environmental um, features. Again, it's more important that you go to the extremes with all of that if you're doing very low microbial biomass where that background signal is really going to be important. But for sure, you should think about having some sort of sham or negative control that goes all the way back to sample collection if you can. And a lot of times you can carry those forward all the way through. You can run it through extraction and library prep and so on. Other times, like I said, though, you might introduce your um, community DNA or whole cell um, sample. So whole cells at extraction introduce your community DNA at library prep. And that, that's because then you can separately control for those two different things. If you introduce the cells at extraction and then there's some bias in the extraction, but what if there's also bias at library prep, you're not gonna be able to tell from the extraction control what was the bias specifically from library prep. So that's why you introduce a DNA control at library prep as well to, to differentiate between the two. And the purpose, the purpose of these is to identify those unexpected problems, things that happen that will reduce your sensitivity, introduce contamination, or bias the results, and to detect batch effects, which could be a big clue that something's going on. Okay. So a little bit more about defined community standards and we'll wrap up and do some questions. Um, so like I said, these have to be defined. You have to know exactly what's in it. And I strongly advocate against trying to homebrew them. I know sometimes in certain fields you have to because the things that you're interested in are not available in a um, sort of manufactured and standardized um, standard, but it's very difficult to actually know and be able to control the ratios of the bacteria or the DNA or whatever and, and keep that consistent. Um, so yeah, we prefer using sort of the same ones that are produced in mass by companies or some other standards entity that I'll talk about. Um, you can get them, like I said, as whole cells, so mixed communities of bacteria. They're a frozen pellet. That's how they come to you. So they've already been frozen, but they haven't been lysed. Or you can get the DNA. So the genome copies of the bacteria are mixed in equal ratio, essentially, or known ratio. Um, so controlling, the things that are important to control for with this is, you know, are you lysing both ground negatives and ground positives well in your extraction process? You can also use these to look at, are you recovering low biomass taxa? So some of these samples purposefully have low biomass entities in them. And then you can see, did I extract and detect that bacteria in my control? Give me some expectation of really how low biomass I'm detecting in my um, true samples, my experimental samples. Um, and to monitor or determine what is the optimal sample handling procedures, you need controls to work that out. Um, like I said, with library prep, you can examine this taxa or GC bias. Um, with sequencing, controls can help you detect and account for barcode hopping. And then they can carry forward into the bioinformatics to look at your taxonomic assignment. Is it sensitive and specific for all of the taxa in your controls? It's a good measure of whether you're on the right track. Oops. Went too far. Okay, so these are just a couple slides. This is actually some data that um, Hen has been putting together for me and other stuff in the IMC data science core. This is just, we're starting to compile all of our standard DNA, sorry, standard um, sequence runs from the last few years of experiments, the last few years of sequencing data that we've generated and run, and just look at the variants. This is where the field doesn't have a good answer is, how good is good enough? <laughs> is it good enough to just see all the bugs you're expected to see, to have the ratios look pretty much like they were expected? 
to actually put a mathematical number on this in terms of, you know, how good did I do in representing a bacterial profile that was expected and known, the math for that and the sort of standard application of that is still kind of lacking in the field. It's starting to be developed. There are some papers and algorithms out there, but it's not universally applied in the field at all. And for sure, um, people are not accounted in that way at all at peer review. Most of the time in peer review, they only want to see, did you use controls? Um, and did you sort of use controls to maybe look at batch effects? And a lot of times I've even seen authors come back and say, we know we didn't have batch effects because our controls, we detected every bug we and just in our controls in every batch. Abundance doesn't matter to them. It's just we detected it and that flies in peer review. So <laughs> it's hard to fix and like get these things to change, but so far that's where we're at. We should be running controls. We should be looking at the data, but how good is good enough is hard to say. So this is what we're getting in the IMC. We can see the expected values for the Zymo community here, um, the standard Zymo community on the left. You can see the expected values, and then you can see what we've been getting. Interestingly, you can even control the expected values by lot, and they have also ways to change and adapt your expected values based on copy number. So you can tweak what the expected is, you know, using your Zymo control and compare exactly to what you got. But you can see with 16S, it's pretty consistent. We've also used some other controls that are a little bit more complex, but also then still commercially available. Um, we've used, um, this is the Zymo gut um, control. We've also used some of the ATCC ones. So you can see it's a little bit more complex and then a little more variable in like how well we replicate what we expect from the control. And then this is shotgun. So you can see overall, still even more kind of variability um, from experiment to experiment. And yeah, I don't know, it's like certain experiments kind of are standout. So what we're doing right now is trying to dial into exactly what library prep methods and extraction, um, sorry, library prep, extraction doesn't vary too much, but library prep definitely has varied over the last few years, as well as um, sequencing platform, we sequence on Nova and HiSeq. So we're looking at, those variables to see if we can sort some of this out. Oopsies, I went backwards. Okay, so where can you find standards to use in your experiments? So this is the International Microbiome and Multiomic Standards Alliance, um, of which I'm a contributing member. And um, their goal is to just continue to develop and build this understanding of best practices, move the field along. They have a great resources webpage where they have links to all of these commercially available, um, publicly available um, standards. Um, they also have like links to all the main microbiome standards organizations that have other kinds of things like data sets that you can use um, to control. So then I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Canada with the impact. Um, we've been coming up, we've been working on developing our own microbiome standard. Um, the reason is that these, particularly the host whole cell ones, they're quite expensive. Um, you don't get many uses out of each order. Uh, and we can't actually import very easily. A lot of the host whole cell ones that are um, manufactured in the US or other places, they tend to have some bugs in them that are like fish pathogens and then we can't import them. So we're home brewing our own Canadian um, whole cell control here. Um, and we're also trying to make this more complex. Whether or not this is a good idea remains to be seen, but you know, most of the others have no more than 20 taxa and we are spiking in 45 unique taxa, some of which are very novel. And so it will also be like a good challenge for your bioinformatics. Are you detecting these bacteria? Um, the other thing that we're doing, this is a collaboration with Emma Allen Verco. So this is kind of her brainchild, but you spike in the strains into a matrix of human feces. So you actually have like all the bacteria and the stuff in the human feces. So you have to get through that like component and control for that component and then detect your spiked in bugs, right? So it's kind of like making it much more of a realistic challenge to, um, to our samples. So this is how we have been making these. We got healthy human fecal samples. We have been doing shotgun sequencing on them. We've also got the isolates of all the spike in strains and we've just finished the whole genome sequences on those. Um, 
These then were sort of pooled in Emma Allen Verco's lab and aliquoted, and we've been distributing them in Canada for a year now to probably 25 different labs so far. So we are hoping to distribute the reference data set so everybody can map their reads back um, this month or next, and then you know we'll see how they're performing and see what we might learn when we challenge you know, <laughs> our methods even harder. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. It's a lot of bugs. In theory, they're equal abundance. We know they're not, which so we'll be sort of telling people based on our own sequencing um, what, what we found in terms of our typical abundance uh, ratios. Okay, so I'll just close with um, the IMPACT website. If you haven't seen it, I suppose you have because most of you were registered here, but the resources tab up there um, is going to have the information of where you can find those standards if you want to sign up and have them shipped to you. Um, and there's links to SOPs. Some of them still need to, to get uploaded here in the next little bit, but some of our sample handling procedures, we are definitely trying to make them public so you can benefit from them.